Hello and welcome to part two of this lecture series. Today we're going to delve inside a CPU and see what we find. So some basic information just to get us started. Processors work by continuously fetching instructions from memory, decoding them and executing them. And this is what is known as the fetch, decode, execute cycle. If you watch my GCSE videos on the same topic, you should already be quite familiar with them. But if not, we will go into this um, fetch, decode, execute cycle in quite a lot of detail later on. Now, the CPU is often described as the brain of a computer, but this is slightly misleading. Uh, your CPU doesn't actually think in the way that maybe a human does, but what it does do is carry out instructions and it can carry out instructions very, very quickly. So inside your CPU, inside a processor, there are billions of transistors. And effectively, these are electronic switches. So we've got some kind of simple examples here. And on a CPU, these kind of transistors are incredibly small. And we can put lots and lots and lots of them onto a small amount of silicon. So at the moment, I think using latest kind of technologies, uh, the size of a transistor on a CPU chip is down to about 10 nanometers, depending on the manufacturing technique. So this is incredibly small, 10 nanometers. And that's how we can fit lots of them on a single chip. Now, when we talk about CPUs and CPU technology, we often talk about Moore's law. So I just want to go through that in a little bit of detail. So Gordon Moore, Dr. Moore, helped found Intel. Now Intel, as you probably know, are the largest chip maker for laptop and desktop PCs. They make lots and lots of CPUs every year. So you probably heard a lot of the chips like the i3, the i5, the i7, etc. So they make lots of chips for PCs. And Gordon Moore, in 1965, made a prediction, well, more of an educated guess. But he said the number of transistors on a processor would double approximately every two years. So if you have one transistor on a chip, two years later in the same amount of space, you'll have two and then four, etc., etc. So roughly speaking, doubling the amount of transistors increases the speed of the processor because you're sort of doubling the power each time you do that. So every two years, the power of a CPU is going to double because you can fit twice as many transistors on it. So this has some interesting effect. So one thing is about reducing cost. Uh, a CPU that might have been top of the range 10 or 15 years ago can be produced incredibly cheaply today. And this is why you can get things like the Raspberry Pi or similar systems, which are tiny little computers that you can pick up very cheaply. And again, if you took something like a Raspberry Pi back 20 years, it would have actually been really, really powerful. But now we can make it almost for pocket money prices. It also means if you want to keep the, SIP, the, sorry, the chip the same power, because the te technology is getting better and better, we can half the size approximately every two years. So if you've got a chip that is of a certain power, in two years, technology means you can have the same power in half the space, and then half the space again, and half the space again and again. And this is why we can get really powerful computers into our smartphones and tablets and pretty much carry them around in our pockets. Because the technology is continuously advancing, following Moore's law, we can get chips that are much more powerful or much more cheaper or much more smaller because the number of transistors we can fit in the same amount of silicon is doubling approximately every two years. Now, while Moore's law has held true for most of the time since it was predicted in 1965, we're starting to come to the end of that. We're starting to fall behind Moore's law. And that's just because it's becoming very difficult to keep making these transistors smaller and smaller. As I mentioned, we're down to approximately 10 nanometers. Getting much beyond this is going to be very difficult. So we're having a look at other ways of designing CPUs, other technologies, if we're going to keep this phenomenal increase in power true. 
So while we're going through this series of uh, lectures, please note that the model of the processor we're going to be looking at is an abstraction. Uh, it's a simplified model. CPUs are very, very complicated, and we don't want to get into a great deal of technical depth about one particular type of processor. We're going to be looking at kind of generalized features that you would find in most processors in the world today. So here's a kind of quick abstract diagrams to kind of show you some of the things we're going to be looking at. We've got CPU, we've got buses connecting that CPU to RAM, and we're going to be looking at all the kind of different features that you're going to find on this kind of setup. So we're going to start by looking at buses. So if we just go back, we've got some buses here. Hopefully you remember from the last video, buses are communication channels which we use to send data around the computer. There are lots of different types of buses in a modern computer system. There's three that we're going to study in this CPU lesson, and these are the address bus, the data bus, and the control bus. So you don't have to worry too much about the technical details of this diagram. This is just one I've kind of just copied from the internet, and just to show you. So connecting your CPU and your memory You've got to know about these three different types of buses. Again, this is an abstraction. Modern computers, uh, we'd be talking about a system bus. But for this exam syllabus, we just like to divide it into three different functions and make sure we can describe what each of these buses does. So very simply, the address bus provides a memory address to the system memory and input output addresses to the system input output devices so basically it holds a location an address in memory of where data is to be found we've also got the data bus this transfers the data between the microprocessor and the memory and the out input output devices connected to the system so while the address bus holds locations in memory the data bus is actually holding the data and this might be data that's going to be put into memory, or it might be data that's being sent from memory to the CPU. And then last, we've got the control bus. This provides control signals that cause the memory or input or output to perform a read or write operation. So we'll come back and we'll mention these different buses again a little bit later, but that's kind of the basic information that you need to know right now. Let's take a look at registers, because we looked at registers briefly with the von Neumann architecture, and registers are very important in a modern computer system. So remember, a register is a discrete memory location within the CPU designed to hold temporary data and instructions. They work at extremely fast speed, so it can be used by the processor without causing a bottleneck. So remember, we looked at the von Neumann bottleneck, and this is the idea that Getting information from memory to the CPU back to the memory is quite slow. Your CPU is really fast, but transporting data from the memory to the CPU takes a long time. So the actual specific data and instructions your CPU is working on, you want to hold in registers which are built into the CPU. Now, there are a number of general purpose registers uh, on most CPUs that programmers can use to hold intermediate results while working through a calculation or an algorithm. But our main focus is not on the general purpose registers. We're going to be looking at special purpose registers because uh, this is what they're going to ask you about in your exams. So a special purpose register is a register that is designed to carry out a specific role. So different manufacturers of CPUs have different types of specific purpose registers and might give them different names. But for this course, we're going to look at these ones here. We're going to be looking specifically at the program counter, the current instruction register, the memory address register, the memory data register, and the accumulator. So for short, we might refer to the PC, the CIR, the MAR, the MDR, or the ACC. So make sure you know both. In exams, if you just want to write the short version like MAR in an exam answer, you'll also get credit the same as you would if you wrote memory address register. But obviously read the questions um, carefully and make sure you answer them in the right way.
Just a little note, there's a thing called the little man computer, which is an assembly emulator. Now, assembler is a very low level language that can be converted very simply into machine code. And it's a good way of studying how registers and memory work. So later on, I will do a full series of lecture notes about the little man computer. But it's well worth going online, doing a Google search and playing around a little with it because it really get, does show you how things like the program counter and the address register, the accumulator, the memory, and how they all work together when a program is being run at a very low level. And I'll give you some, ex and at least one example of code for this type of, type of system a little bit later on. So let's go through all the registers. The first one we're going to study is the PC, which stands for program counter, not personal computer in this case. We're looking at registers, so it's the program counter. Now this holds the address in memory of the next instruction. So it holds the location of the next instruction, not the actual instruction itself. It's just where to find it. So for example, if the program counter has the address 305, then the next instruction will be at location 305 in the main memory, what we often call RAM. When the programming is running, the program counter will often just increment to point at the very next instruction. So as it's working its way through the fetch, decode, execute cycle, it will just move from 305 to 306 and then 307 to 308. So often it is sequential. It just goes from one instruction straight to the next, incrementing by one each time. However, sometimes the instruction being processed will modify the next address. So for example, the program doesn't want to go to location 305 next. Maybe the next instruction is at location 390 or 75 or another memory location. This is what we call a jump instruction. And these are instructions that alter the flow of control. So if you think about when you're programming, you often have conditionals. You'll have your if, else if, else statements. If one thing is true, do this. If something else is true, do something else. And this is a kind of code that would cause a jump instruction. So a time when you don't want to go to the very next line of code, you want to jump somewhere else. And when this is transferred into low level code, we've got a jump instruction. So to summarize, the program counter holds the location of the next instruction to be processed. Usually as the programming is, is running, it just gets incremented by one. However, sometimes there will be a jump instruction and then the code will actually jump to somewhere completely different in memory. It will be low, so the program counter will be updated to reflect this new uh, location for the next instruction as a result of the jump instruction. So in assembly, uh, using a little man computer, there are three commands that can cause uh, branching instructions, jump instructions to happen. And again, we'll take a look at these in more detail when we cover assembly language, but we've got branch always, branch if positive, and branch if zero. And all conditions have to boil down to this when we're using the little man computer. The next one we're going to look at is the memory address register or MAR. And the memory address register stores the address of the data or instructions that are going to be fetched from memory or sent to memory. Okay. So again, it's not holding the actual data or instruction. It's just holding the location or the address. So where the information is going to be sent to or where it's going to be fetched from and brought to the CPU. However, the memory data register, the MDR, actually stores this data. So this is the data that has been fetched from memory and brought to the CPU or data that needs to be sent from the CPU and stored in the main memory. The current instruction register, CIR, uh, sometimes I might just say instruction register for short, but I'll be meaning the same thing. So the CIR stores the most recently fetched instruction waiting to be decoded and executed. 
So an instruction has been taken from memory, it's gone to the CPU, and it's being held in the CIR, waiting to be decoded and executed. So if all this is confusing, I will go through some examples with you, because they do sound fairly similar. And the last one is the accumulator. We looked at this briefly when we looked at the von Neumann architecture. And this just stores the results of calculations made by the ALU. So if you're using the little man computer, there are a couple of instructions that would involve the accumulator. You would have LDA, and this means load. So load something from memory and store it into the accumulator. And you have STA, which is the opposite. It means store, and it means store whatever is in the accumulator into the memory location. So LDA and STA are two instructions that would involve the accumulator if you're programming the little man system. Of course, just a little note, the modern computers usually don't really have an accumulator. They'll have lots of general purpose registers that have the same effect. But for our purposes, for this exam syllabus, you did need to know about the accumulator and you do need to be able to describe it. So let's have a look at the fetch decode execute cycle. So programs are stored in memory as machine language instructions in binary. And the task of the control unit, or one of these tasks, is to execute programs by repeatedly carrying out the fetch decode execute cycle. So fetch from memory, decode the instruction, execute it, and then fetch the next instruction. And that's what your CPU is basically doing billions of times a second. If we have a look at the next diagram, we're going to just have a little look at different parts of your CPU that are involved. So for main memory, we need to fetch our instructions. And we're going to be using the control unit here because it's going to be in charge of sending the signal that has the read operation. It's going to be decoding the instruction. We're going to be using lots of different registers. Once we get the data, we're going to be executing it. And this might be using the ALU. And once we're finished, we're going to go back to memory and fetch the next instruction. So let's go through it step by step for um, this example. Step one. The program counter copies the address of the next instruction it contains into the memory address register. So it goes from the PC to the MAR. So this is the next instruction to be processed. So whatever's in the program counter at the start of the fetch cycle gets transformed, sorry, transformed, transferred into the memory address register. The control unit loads the address to be used on the address bus. Remember the address bus just whole is just for the location in memory of the data that's to be fetched. The control unit triggers a read signal that causes the main, the main memory to place the instruction being asked for onto the data bus. So fetch cycle, quite a lot's going on here. Whatever the instruction, sorry, the location of the instruction in the program counter gets transferred into the memory address register. Then that has to get loaded onto the address bus. The control unit triggers a read operation. So the means that we can find this in the main memory, this location, and whatever information is in that memory location is going to get placed on the data bus so they get transferred back to the CPU. The instruction that's been sent down the data bus is loaded into the memory data register or MDR. And then the memory data register copies this instruction into the CIR, the current instruction register. So it's going to go from the MDR, hopefully you can see that, and then it's going to move to the CIR. So it's gone from, originally it was in memory, it's traveled along the data bus, it goes into the memory data register, and then it's like, hey, this is an instruction, it needs to be processed. So then it gets moved to the current instruction register to wait to be decoded and executed. Now, the program counter can be reset to point to the next instruction. So usually this will just be incremented by one to point to the next instruction. However, during the execution phase, 
and there may be a need to have a jump instruction, so it might point to a completely different memory location. But once we've finished all this, the fetch stage is now complete. So now that we've finished the fetch stage, let's take a look at the decode stage. So at the decode stage, the control unit examines the instruction in the current instruction register and decodes it. Okay, so it needs to understand what the instruction is so that it can therefore be executed. For example, the instruction might see add. The code unit understands that this means what this means and gets the system ready to carry out that instruction. So every CPU has an instruction set that defines what the coder understands as a legitimate command. All software eventually ends up as a set of commands from within the instruction set. So each CPU has a set of instructions that it understands, and the instruction that it's decoding has to match one of those instructions. Otherwise, the program could crash. Now we move on to the execute stage. So the instruction within the instruction register is carried out or executed by the CPU. Depending on the instruction, this process may make use of the accumulator, the arithmetic logic unit, it may take extra data values from memory. It all depends on exactly what the instruction wants. At that point, we've got what we call repeat or reset because the fetch decode execute cycle has to start again. It goes back to the fetch stage and fetches the next instruction. So this is the fetch decode execute cycle that is present in every sequential processing computer. So here's a little diagram. It's got colors in it and bounces around, but kind of simplified version of what I've just gone through. So if all that's making your head spin, bad news, we need to get into a bit more detail. And that's because the exam board like to mix assembly code and CPU technical stuff together to really test your knowledge. So for example, what they might do is give you a small piece of assembly code and ask you to describe what's happening inside the CPU when it's being run. Now I am going to spend a lot more time on assembly in a future lesson, but we're just going to look at a very simple program just now, just to see how it works. So first of all, let's just take a look at the bottom of the code. And here we've got what might be the equivalent of variables in a higher level language. All we're doing is we're labeling memory locations in a way that we can understand and giving it data. So we've got number one, which has the value five, number two, which has the value 10. And then for example, you might have another label that there has no value just now because that's going to have a value added to it during the running of the program. The actual code is at the top here and the commands are quite simple. Load in number one, which is five, of course. Add number two, which is 10. And then store this in memory as total, which is, of course, this here. And the last instruction is HLT, which is halt or stop the program. And when we take assembly code and we're going to run it, it's going to go into different memory locations. So here you can see line one goes into the first memory location, which is called zero. Add number two goes to memory location one. Store total goes to memory look, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can see each line goes in here plus number five goes into location four. Oh, we've gone forward a bit. Now, obviously, we don't know the name of the, sorry, the number of this memory location. Uh, that's up for the computer to know, but we can just refer to it as number one, and the computer understands that it means memory location four. It understands that when we see number two, it goes to memory location five and can fetch the number 10. But I will go into this in more detail later. So you can see here, we've got our, all our registers. We've got the control unit, the ALU, all the buses. And we're just going to see how these update and change as we load this simple program. So the program counter is going to start at zero because that is where the, fet the first instruction needs to be fetched from. So the value from the program counter gets transferred to the register. So register, the memory address register. 
So the program counter starts at zero and the value from the program counter gets loaded into the memory address register. The control unit then sends a read signal down the control bus. The value in the memory address register, which is zero, is sent down the address bus. So the location of, so the contents of memory location zero can be fetched. Okay. So if I just kind of just quickly go through that again, zero is the volume in the program counter that goes into the memory address register. The control unit activates a control signal. It's going to be a read operation. And then the value zero can go down the address bus so that we can then get the data from memory location zero and get that first instruction and begin to move it to the CPU. So the contents stored at memory location zero, in this case, load number one, are sent along. I'm going to rub that out. That should say data bus. That's a typo. Whoops, bad teacher. So this gets transferred along the data bus and back to the CPU. So first of all, it's going to be stored in the memory data register, first of all. And then because it's an instruction, it's going to get transferred to the current instruction register. So now we can increment the program counter by one. So from zero to one, so that it points at the next instruction. And this is the end of the fetch stage. So we haven't decoded or executed the instruction yet. All we've done is go to memory, fetch that first instruction, and move it back to the CPU. So this is probably the most complicated set of steps to describe. The decode and execute are a little bit simpler. So now let's look at the decode part of the fetch decode execute cycle. So the contents of the con current instruction register are sent to the control unit. So in the current instruction register, we have LDA number one. This goes to the control unit because it needs to be decoded. And this instruction means load the contents of num1 into the accumulator. So the location of num1 is loaded into the memory address register. It says load num1. Well, num1 is at memory location four. So we need to take four and put it in the memory address register. And then we can load that onto the address bus. Execute cycle. The control unit sends a read signal down the control bus and the value in the memory address register is sent down the address bus. So again, memory address bus is now location four. We can send it down the address bus and we can find this data. So memory location four holds the value five. This can then be sent down the data bus and goes to the memory data register and then from the memory data register onto the accumulator. So if we just erase that, hopefully we can see that's on the accumulator. So again, you can see it's going backwards and forth quite a lot. Just to make sure we get all the data that we need to be processed in the CPU. And this all starts again for the next line of code. The program counter would be then be pointing at number one. So now we have to do the same thing again to add number two. Same set of steps all just to increase the accumulator by the next value and end up with a total of 15. So as you can see, it's quite involved. There are a lot of steps and you really need to know the values of the accumulator, the memory address register, the program counter, etc., which buses are used at the different stages. So feel free to play this again and hopefully it's fairly clear. Okay, let's do a quick summary. I know it's been a lot, it's a lot to take in. A processor has an arithmetic logic unit, control unit, and registers. It uses three basic buses, address bus, control bus, and data bus. And it works by continuously carrying out the fetch decode execute cycle. And we have to know how the fetch decode execute cycle works in quite a lot of detail, just to make sure we can grab all those points in the exam. So I'll come back with another uh, lesson in this series next week. And in the future, we'll go into assembly code in a lot more detail. So don't worry if that wasn't entirely clear. But what you might want to do is take that basic program that we saw earlier, load it into the little man computer. It's available on the web if you do a Google search. 
and just run it and just see how it works. That might give you a better idea. So good luck with your studies and I'll see you next time.